and we're back. <laughs> a quick interruption. Okay, uh, so that was, let's see, we stopped on page, sorry, we stopped on page 48, suddenly. <laughs> okay, we're back to page 48, and um, William had just written her and said he missed Mrs. Parker's cherry pie, and poor Jane is like, oh, I wish he missed me instead. So she's going to write back, May 18th, 1852. Dear Dr. Balt, I assure you that I am working very hard at Miss Hepplewhite's. In fact, I shall relate to you the lesson I learned this very day. Did you know that when calling on acquaintances, the visit should not last, should last no longer than 10 minutes? So when calling, remember that means going to someone's house. So if you suddenly show up at someone's house, you're only supposed to stay no more than 10 minutes. Miss Hepplewhite's related to us that a lengthy unwelcome visit, above all, is a snare to be avoided. It is also, it's so hard to read this writing, it is also vital that a return call be made no longer than a week following the first call so as not to offend. But as much visiting occurs, and in order to avoid forgetting who has vis visited when and whom one is obliged to visit, Miss Hepplewhite recommended keeping a list of all visitors. It is a very clever idea and I have begun a list. Miss Hepplewhite has announced an embroidery contest in school. I am going to sew a small pocket handkerchief. I think of you often and hope that you are thinking of me. Yours truly, Miss Jane Peck. So uh, one thing that she mentioned was that's what they would do. So if someone came to visit you, then you needed to go and visit them within a certain amount of time. You needed to go back. And then once you visited them, then they were obligated to visit you within a certain amount of time. So it was very, you know, a lot going on. So they kept, they kept lists. Um, interesting, she kind of put herself out there. She ended with, I'm thinking of you often. So I don't know what your opinion is about that. Okay, Christmas arrived and with it, another letter from William. It was without question, the best of gifts. So she wrote in May, she's receiving um, his letter at Christmas. His letter is September 1st, 1852. So you can see it's taking four months or so to get back and forth. My dearest Jane, the arrival of a letter from Philadelphia and Miss Jane Peck is a very happy occasion on Shoalwater, Shoalwater Bay. I'm afraid no one in the bay possesses your wit and charm. As it takes so long for the wait to make, sorry, for the mail to make a round trip from Philadelphia to Shoalwater Bay, there is no need for you to wait for my letters before writing to me one of your own. Therefore, I dearly hope you will be encouraged to write me whenever the fancy takes you and I shall do the same. So he's saying, don't wait to write me back, just like write me whenever. It is quite apparent from your correspondence that you are becoming a most accomplished young lady. No one out here keeps with such good etiquette, but perhaps I shall recommend it. I miss the wonderful suppers at Walnut Street. Most of all, I miss your delightful company. Do you still wear green? Please consider this ribbon a token of my special affection for you. I eagerly await you, your next correspondence. You are in my thoughts and heart always. As ever I remain, William Balt. So, ooh, he sent her a ribbon and said he, that she's in his heart and he misses her acquaint, her company. So quite a big deal. She finally got what she was waiting for. I held the slender pale green ribbon to my lips and smiled. If I had doubted that William returned my affections, I did so no longer. His most recent letter made his warm feelings clear. William's sweet letters sustained me through the hard months of winter and rainy days of spring when it seemed that everything I accomplished at Miss Hepplewhite's disappointed Papa, like the day I won the embroidery contest. It had been, it had been exciting beyond words. I had drawn, up, drawn top marks for my embroidery of a small violet on a pocket handkerchief. I had even bested Sally Biddle who had sewn a dove, a rather lopsided dove in my opinion. Miss Hepplewhite declared that I had the neatest small stitch of any girl ever to attend the academy. Her praise rang in my ears all the way home. I could hardly wait to tell Papa the good news. He was sitting in his study reading a book and eating a piece of Mrs. Parker's cherry pie when I rushed in the door. Papa, look, I said, waving the prize handkerchief in the air. I won, I won first prize. Humph, he said, sounding unimpressed. I'll be sure to have you stitch some flowers on the forehead of my next patient. 
Disappointment rushed through me. Didn't he understand how important this was? I stomped my foot. Papa! Papa sighed, his face gray. He was very tired of late, and I knew it was because of the yellow fever. Mothers and fathers had been banging on our door at all hours, bringing their sick children. Papa forbade me to come downstairs when patients called. There's no vaccination for yellow fever, Janie. I don't want you endangered. He had kept me trapped upstairs last year, too, when smallpox had raged through the slums. The, and there was a vaccination for smallpox. His excuse then had been, Janie, the vaccination is generally effective, but there have been cases reported of vaccinated persons getting the pox, and I don't want you endangered. Papa looked at my face and softened. Oh, Janie, he said, his voice catching. I miss my little girl. What's happened to you? Now all I hear is talk of pouring tea and fashion and embroidery. And the only book you ever read is that useless etiquette book. But Papa, here, he said in an encouraging voice, sit down and talk with, to me. He held out his plate. Have a piece of pie with your dear old pa. It's Mrs. Parker's cherry pie, your favorite. I can't eat pie, I said stiffly, putting my hand to the corset on my waist. While my waist was somewhat slimmer, I had a considerable way to go before I looked on the verge of fainting, as Miss Heppelwhite recommended. Why not? Because I'm fat. I'm fat as a pig. And I'll never have a waist as thin as Sally Biddle's if I go around eating pie, I shouted in frustration. Papa smiled gently. Janie, he said. My sweet Janie, you're not fat. You're lovely. You're the picture of your beautiful mother. Then my mother was fat, I burst out. Papa went white. I turned and ran from the study. Janie, he barked. I just, but I just closed my bedroom door and cried. You can see why I came to depend upon William's encouraging words. He alone seemed to understand the importance of my education and all my hard work was paying off. Oops, okay. And all my hard work was paying off. The proof of it arrived one warm May afternoon in a heavy crisp envelope, an invitation to the Midsummer Gala at Cora Fletcher's house. Mr. and Mrs. Fletcher's Midsummer Gala was an annual event and invitations were greatly coveted. Mary and I spent all of our time finding me the perfect dress and endlessly discussed how she should arrange my hair. She tried out different styles in the evenings. My favorite was a fashionable one that involved a lot of ringlet curls. I thought it was quite charming, if a little complicated. I think it's lovely, I said, patting the curls. Mary just shook her head. If you want to look like a sheep. When the day of the gala arrived, the house was a hive of activity with Mrs. Parker and Mary, almost as excited as I was. What's all the fuss about, Papa asked. Oh, sir, our miss, young miss is going to her first party, Mrs. Parker said, beaming. Party? I've been invited to Cora Fletcher's Midsummer Gala, I said in exasperation. I told you weeks ago. Cora who? Cora Fletcher, Papa. That Harry Fletcher's girl? Yes, Papa, the Fletchers are only one of the most important families in Philadelphia. Harry Fletcher important? He asked, rubbing his beard thoughtfully. Papa! He sighed warily and looked at me standing there in my fancy evening dress. You look lovely, he said gruffly. You'll be the most beautiful girl there. When I arrived at the Fletcher house, the rooms were already full of impeccably dressed girls and handsome young men. I smoothed my pale green skirt self-consciously and checked my hair in the hall mirror. Hello, Jane, Cora Fletcher said. What a charming dress. Thank you, I smiled nervously. You have a lovely house. She shrugged. I would suppose so. I followed her into the parlor where a group of girls were in rapt conversation. I felt a moment's anxiety, but remembering Miss Heppelwhite's advice on such situations, I took a deep breath, passed on a winning smile, pasted, <clears throat> sorry, pasted on a winning smile and took a step toward them. Almost immediately, I felt a tap on my shoulder. Would you like some punch, Jane? Sally Vittle asked, her eyes mild, a cup in her hands. That would be lovely, I said, surprised, but pleased taking the cup. Sally Biddle peered across the room. I do believe I see Horace Fink. And as she brushed past me, I felt her arm shove my elbow hard. The glass tipped and punch soaked the bosom of my dress and dripped down my skirts. It would be like her whole chest. Oh dear, what a mess, Cora Fletcher said, shaking her head. The other girls eyed me with pity. From across the room, I saw Sally Biddle's grin. So you have to decide, did Sally Biddle do that on purpose or not? The next morning, the letter arrived that would change my life forever and not a moment too soon. I had not gone to school as my eyes were puffy and swollen from crying all night. February 14th, 1853. My dearest Jane, gosh, I can't see this. 
How time has passed. Has it truly been three years since last I saw your face? So that's why you have to understand she's grown up. Now she's almost 16 and you'll see. When I think of you, I picture you in a beautiful green dress with your lovely red hair caught up. I miss you more than words can say. By my calculations, you shall be past 15 as you read this letter, and I imagine you are now an accomplished, lovely young woman. Do you recall how you said that you would like to come out to the frontier with me one day? I am now situated in comfortable accommodations on Shoalwater Bay. Will you, dearest Jane, will you come west and be my wife? As ever, I remain your devoted servant, William. I know, and 15, she'd be going on 16. I know that would be like now, like shocking to get married, but at that time, that wouldn't be quite out of the ordinary. It is young, but it wouldn't be like no one gets married at 16. It would happen. The letter shook in my hand. William wanted to marry me. Joy rushed through me. Being his wife is the answer to all my dreams. And after last evening, I knew there was nothing for me here in Philadelphia. Sally Biddle would always be there, waiting to ruin my happiness. I ran to Papa's study and burst in without even knocking. Papa looked up and rubbed his eyes. He took a small bottle of medicine and drank from it. Not green again, he said, eyeing my dress and rubbing his lips. Did you make every dress out of the same god-awful bolt of fabric? I never see you in any other color. I was determined not to lose my temper. William says that green suits me. Papa snorted. If you like the color of bile, bile is like uh, that acid that you vomit up. I refused to dignify that remark with a response. Papa, look, I said urgently, holding out the letter. Papa stared at the letter for a long time. When he looked up, there was a shuddered expression on his face. No, he said. But Papa, you're too young to be married. I'm 15. He slammed his fist on the desk, upsetting the little bottle. No daughter of mine is going out to the godforsaken frontier. There's cholera on the, tra on the trail. You'll die before you even get there. Then I shall take a ship. You will not. You will stay here. But I love him. The room went silent. Papa opened his mouth to speak, but all that came out was a cough. Soon he was coughing so hard that he was fighting for air, his whole body shaking. I rushed around the dust to help him. Papa, he coughed into his handkerchief and then pushed me away, his eyes watery and red. Don't you have school today? He asked harshly, a bleak expression on his face. He turned his back on me and stared out the window. Miss Hepplewhite had said that a young lady might employ tears to further her goals, but tears had little effect on my iron-willed Papa. Papa just shook his head and handed me a handkerchief. Jane, he said, you are transfixed with, transfixed with William for the wrong reasons. There's nothing for you out on that frontier. It's dangerous. There are plenty of eligible young bachelors right here in Philadelphia. There's no call to follow one out west, especially one with no sense. I bristled. You're mistaken. William is the finest man with whom I have ever been acquainted. What kind of man throws away an education to chop down trees? Papa demanded fiercely. William has chosen a hard and dangerous and lonely life by settling on the frontier, a life I don't want my only daughter to share. I'd rather be dead than be without William, I said, my voice rising to a pitch. Janie, he said, Papa said in a weary voice, you are being very foolish now. The house was in an uproar. Everyone had an opinion about the situation. Oh, miss, it'll break the doctor's heart if you go away, Mrs. Parker said, sounding miserable. Even Mary required convincing. I sat at the dressing table as Mary brushed my hair with long, smooth strokes. While I had acquaintances at school, Mary was the one to whom I most often told my troubles. She was sweet and wise, and I found her company a great comfort. Not to mention, she was the only one who could do anything with my hair. Papa is the most stubborn man in all of Philadelphia, I said, staring hard at my reflection in the mirror. Well, you have the most stubborn hair in all of Philadelphia, Mary said. It must come from somewhere. I would not be humored out of my mood. Papa understands nothing. Does he want me to end up a spinster? Can't he see how wonderful William is? Dr. Pup Peck seems smart enough to me, Mary said with a sharp tug to my hair. Ouch, don't pull so. Why would you want to leave? She asked, waving a hand around my bedroom at the four post bed, the quilt, the curtains. You couldn't possibly understand, I said. The brush tugged my scalp painfully. Mary, that hurt. Sorry, Mary said with an innocent grin and a half shrug. Never learned how to brush hair. We Irish girls don't understand anything, you know. Very amusing, I studied Mary in the mirror. What about you, Mary? What do you want? Well, Mary said, looking thoughtful. 
I'd like something of my own, where I'd be my own mistress, free to do as I pleased. She said free with such longing that I was startled. But Mary, you're as free as any young woman. Mary stared at me and said, am I now? Do you really think so, Miss Jane? I have to make a living, Jane, my girl, she explained patiently. You wouldn't understand. I'm sure there are a lot of hungry men on the frontier who would appreciate your cooking, I said. Her eyes met mine in the mirror. I could have a boarding house. I could make a fortune, she said, her dark eyes glinting, war warming to the idea. She groaned dramatically. I'd go there just so I c wouldn't have to comb this tangled mess every blessed day. I grabbed Mary's hand and she smiled at me. Would you come with me if I went out west? Mary grinned, her eyes bright. Jane, my girl, what would you do without me? So there's three dots showing time has passed again. It seemed that my very strength wore on Papa, that as the weeks went by, he grew paler and thinner. Following a warm August, September arrived, and with it, a dark chill that seemed to settle in my bones. Everyone was in a bad mood, especially Papa, who glared at me whenever I mentioned William's name. One night, after, after a particularly strained supper, someone knocked on the door. I assumed it was a patient clamoring for my father's attention. Mary appeared at the door of the dining room with a distinguished older looking man carrying a physician's satchel. Dr. Burns, she announced, tipping her dark head respectfully. Papa stood up and shook the other man's hand. Thank you for coming, Stanley, he turned to me. You remember my colleague, Dr. Burns? Yes, of course, he had been to the house before. Papa was always bringing people home for supper, other physicians, lawyers, bankers, once even brought a judge. Miss Peck, Dr. Burns nodded his head gravely. He seemed a very somber sort of man. You must excuse us, Jane. Dr. Burns and I have some rather urgent matters that requires our attention. They locked themselves in Papa's study and when they emerged, Papa's face was gray. The next morning he called me into his study. It was icy cold, the fire embers, mere embers, and I wondered how long he had been sitting in the room. He stared into the fireplace so still that he seemed almost a statue. Papa? Janie, he said, looking up at me. His face was pink and his cheeks were rosy. He looked better than he had in weeks. Perhaps Dr. Burns had given him a tonic. You're looking well, Papa, I said. He nodded simply. You're my dearest daughter and I love you very much. I wanted to laugh and say I'm your only daughter, but I was too old for such nursery games. And besides, I was angry with him for not letting me marry William. He paused. I have made a decision. A decision? He held up his hand to silence me. If it means so much to you to go west and marry William, then I find I cannot stand in your way. I could hardly believe it. Is this what you truly want? Yes, Papa, I said quickly. It is what I want more than anything. Then go, he said, his voice breaking. His eyes were wet with tears. If it means that much to you, my dear stubborn girl, then go. You must make your own luck. I posted William a letter accepting his offer the very next day. When Mary and I departed two months later on the Lady Luck, Mrs. Parker and Papa came to the docks to bid us farewell. I stood on deck and waved to Papa as we sailed away, and I watched as he and all that I had ever known slowly disappeared. So that ends chapter three. So that will catch us up um, to where the story was had begun, where she's on the ship, and now you know why. Now you know who Mary is, Mary goes with her, and she's heading west to Oregon country to Mary William. It's a very, very tough journey. She's leaving from the East Coast off of uh, Philadelphia, which would be Pennsylvania. She has to go all the way down and around uh, South America and come all the way back up to where current day Oregon State would be. So that would be months on a ship. As we know on her 16th birthday, she's already been on for five months and some odd days. So, um, she's getting close. So the book starts where she's getting very close. I think it's right before they're near San Francisco. So until we read again, farewell. <laughs>